Let's play a game. I'll write some phi values and you try to spot a pattern. Okay, phi of 2 is 1. Phi of 3 equals 2. And phi of 6 equals 2. Phi of 3 equals 2. Phi of 4 equals 2. And phi of 12 equals 4. Any ideas yet? We need more examples. It's something to do with multiplication. Here's another one. Phi of 3 equals 2. Phi of 5 equals 4. And phi of 15 equals 8. Okay, I totally get this. Two threes are six, and three fours are twelve, and three fives are fifteen. That's part of the pattern, but there's a little more to it. Uh, Emmy? I think you're trying to show us that phi is multiplicative. Like, two times three is six, so then phi of two times phi of three is equal to phi of six. Very good. As another example, 18 is 2 times 9, and phi of 18 is equal to phi of 2 times phi of 9. Now, in order to show that phi is multiplicative, we must show that for any natural numbers s and t, if s and t are relatively prime, then phi of s times t equals phi of s times phi of t. The proof for this is quite challenging, and we need to be methodical, so I'm going to break it down into several stages. Following our discussions, you'll need to study the formal proof. Now, if s equals 1, then the situation is quite trivial. phi of s times t is equal to phi of 1 times t, since s is equal to 1, which is just phi of t. On the other hand, phi of s times phi of t, uh, Ron, why don't you take this one? Okay, s is 1, so that equals 1 times phi of t. And that's equal to, um, phi of t. Ooh, I think I did it. Yes, indeed. We have shown that when s is 1, then phi of s times t equals phi of s times phi of t. Actually, Emmy, I did most of the work. Sure thing, Ron. As you'll see when we read the formal proof, the case when t is equal to 1 is equally trivial. We can now focus on the case when both s and t are greater than 1. To find phi of s times t, what do we have to count? We have to count up all the numbers less than and relatively prime to s times t. Exactly, but I propose that instead we count the number that are relatively prime to both s and t. You can't just count a different thing and hope it comes out the same. I mean, I'll count the numbers of books in Emmy's bag, and maybe that's the answer. Count the books in your own bag. My bag's being used by my neighbor's pet weasel. Let me ask you a question. Suppose we have two sets, A and B, and I want to know how many elements are in set A. Can I get the answer by counting the elements in set B? Of course not! Well, you could if they happen to be the same set. Well then, suppose I reveal that they are, in fact, equal. Then you would get the same answer, whichever set you use. But how do you know they're equal? 
I'd have to prove it. How do we prove that a set A is equal to set B? You have to show they have the same objects? I think it's something to do with subsets or something like that. Oh, you have to show they're subsets of each other. Yep, we have to show that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now, how do we show that A is a subset of B? Well, if something is in A, then it has to be in B as well. Very good. If X is an element of A, then we must show that X is also an element of B. And then we just do it the opposite way. Yes, we must also show that if X is an element of B, then X is an element of A. To return to the proof, my claim is that the natural numbers less than and relatively prime to s times t are exactly those that are relatively prime to both s and t. In other words, these two sets are equal. Emmy, what must be proved first? If an element is in the first set, then it must be in the second. So if, let's say, d is a natural number, and it's less than s times t, and it's relatively prime to s times t, then... Then you have to show it's a natural number. He just said it was a natural number. And it's less than s times t. Again, he just said that. And it's relatively prime to s and to t. I bet that's the hard bit. Very good, and of course Ron is correct that some parts of the proof are very trivial and to some extent are glossed over in the formal proof that you will shortly have the opportunity to read. Now, Ron, what is the second thing that must be proved? That if it's relatively prime to s and t, then it's relatively prime to s times t. Well, you skipped over the details about d being a natural number and less than s times t, but yes, your summary is essentially correct. Now, when you work through the proof, there are a couple things to look out for. The proof writer needs a way to indicate that the first part of the proof has been completed and that the second part is about to begin. In this case, the writer uses the word conversely for this purpose, so keep your eye open for that. Also, look out for the use of contradictions in which the writer assumes that such and such does not have a certain property, shows that this leads to a situation that is obviously impossible, and hence concludes that it must have that property after all. Now, time for you to read the formal proof for this first stage. As good mathematicians, you will take your time checking and rechecking that you understand and agree with each step taken by the proof writer. Be assured that your patience and diligence in this matter will pay off handsomely. <laughs>